Welcome back to AP Government with Mr. Kelly. Uh, last week we wrapped up civil liberties and now we're moving on to civil rights. And so we're going to start with uh, some pretty low tech technology here. And uh, so some notes for this course. Um, so civil rights. Civil rights, um, the key concept here is equality. So on last Monday's assignment, there was a piece about uh, equality and the Equal Protection Clause distinguishing civil liberties and civil rights. So when we look back historically to our foundational documents, the Declaration of Independence with its language, all men are created equal, obviously included language regarding equality and, and egalitarianism, um, but the Constitution itself was not a document of equality. It was actually a document that enshrined inequality. And as you can see there, you have the three-fifths compromise, you have the fugitive slave clause, you have uh, the limits on Congress's power to ban the slave trade for 20 years. So these were all ways that the Constitution itself that came out of the convention in Philadelphia in 1787 was a document of inequality. But that ended when we got the 14th Amendment. So the 14th Amendment included that equal protection clause. So last week in some of your responses to the um, which clause of the 14th Amendment dealt with um, civil rights, a number of people put the citizenship clause. And I granted credit for that because I think you're absolutely correct. Now the college board on the AP test, when they used that question, I believe it was 2015, um, they were looking for the Equal Protection Clause as the primary tool. But the Citizenship Clause, which is the first clause of the 14th Amendment, is very significant. So, citizenship, um, the denial of citizenship has long been used as a tool of oppression and inequality. The example there in purple, it says the Nuremberg Laws of 1935. So you may remember from U.S. history or maybe from an AP European history, the Nuremberg Laws were passed by the Nazis in their rise to power. And one of the things they did was they stripped German Jews of their citizenship as Germans. So then Jews could be legally marginalized. They were denied government jobs, taken out of educational jobs, and then their rights were further and further restricted. They lacked legal recourse to challenge mob violence like Kristallnacht, and it escalated all the way up to and including the Holocaust. And the fact that they had first been stripped of their citizenship was a very effective tool in denying civil, civil rights. So if we look in the American example, if we go back to African Americans. They first arrived in the United States in 1619, or what would come to be the United States in 1619. As we pointed out before, that is before the Mayflower arrives at Plymouth Rock in 1620. But African Americans were denied citizenship and therefore legal protection. <clears throat> so the, this, you'll notice in the reading that I've linked, um, this came to a head in the uh, pre-Civil War case of Dred Scott versus Sanford. So many of you remember, again, from U.S. history that Dred Scott was an enslaved African American who sued for his freedom, challenging that because he had been taken to what was then uh, free states and free territories, both the state of Illinois and the Wisconsin Territory at Fort Snelling in what is now uh, the Twin Cities, he said that his enslavement ceased to exist. He lived in a place where slavery was not legal. So he brought his case first in the courts of Missouri, where he lost, and then later to the Supreme Court. And in their ruling, the Supreme Court ruled that Blacks are not citizens and were never intended to be citizens. That was from Chief, Chief Justice uh, Taney, who wrote the opinion in the Dred Scott case. Now, when we look at his uh, statement, his pronouncement that they were never intended to be citizens, he went back to the Naturalization Act of 1790. 
sorry, in my looking at this in the camera, it uh, looked like it said 1990, but 1790. It was the first Naturalization Act. You may remember that under Article I, the express powers of Congress, Congress has the power to uh, develop laws of naturalization to determine who can become citizens. So in 1790, the first Naturalization Act they passed, they made it racially restrictive. Only free white persons could become citizens of the United States. So they defined American citizenship in terms of whiteness. And so uh, despite the fact that Dred Scott, despite being born in the state of Virginia in the United States, Southampton County, Virginia, Dred Scott was denied citizenship. So he could not naturalize an American citizen. And having been born in the lands of the United States after the enactment of the Constitution did not give him rights of citizenship. And so therefore he lacked legal recourse to challenge his enslavement through the federal court system. So obviously, as you learned in US history last year, um, the Dred Scott case in 1857 was a major instigating factor leading to the Civil War. So the Civil War, as we discussed um, when we first looked, sorry, I had my fat fingers in the way there, when we first looked at this, the Civil War um, resolved the question of slavery as its primary, being its primary cause, um, and that was resolved through congressional action with the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution. So we've talked about these before we left for spring break, but now we're going to focus in on the 14th. And as we said before, when I was talking about the Citizenship Clause, the 14th Amendment starts all persons born or naturalized in the United States and uh, subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and the state wherein they reside. So that's the first clause of the uh, 14th Amendment. And then obviously the other key provision for this week is the Equal Protection Clause. So this idea of citizenship. So now we have the idea that if you're born in the United States, you are a citizen of the United States. That is the legal doctrine of what we call jus soli. It's based on the soil. There's also a legal doctrine called jus sanguinis. It's based on blood. And I believe we may have talked about this earlier in the semester. If we did not, um, I apologize. But jus soli, based on the soil of where you're born, that determines citizenship and just sanguinous based on the blood. So <clears throat> after the Civil War, with that provision, all formerly enslaved individuals who were born in the United States became citizens of the United States. This is an example of a check on the Supreme Court. We often struggle to find examples of how the other branches can check the Supreme Court. Well, the uh, addition of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution after the Dred Scott case, after the Civil War, was a way that, the con that Congress could come back and say, we disagree with what the court had done in the Dred Scott decision. And it was necessary because when the 13th Amendment abolished the institution of slavery, it left African Americans in a legal limbo. They were no longer slaves because slavery was not permissible except as punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted. But it had left this question with the Dred Scott case still on the books of whether African-Americans were fully citizens and entitled to all the rights that come with that. And so Congress resolved that. They said, from a political perspective, we're going to uh, extend citizenship to all persons born in the United States, regardless of race or color. They are all going to be a race, ethnicity, color, national origin, anyone, well, not national origin, but the national origin of their parents, anyone born in the United States will be a citizen of the United States. And to kind of clean things up at that same time, Congress dealt with naturalization. And they changed the Naturalization Act and said that all persons, uh, that naturalization as of the Naturalization Act of 1870 would be extended to all free white persons and persons of African ancestry or nativity. 
So by crafting the language in terms of whiteness and African ancestry, obviously I'm sure you can imagine they've left out a lot of people. They've left out Native Americans. They've left out potentially uh, Latinos. They've left out people from all parts of Asia. And so the Naturalization Act was expanded after the Dred Scott decision, but only slightly. Well, with the end of Reconstruction that gave us the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, then we saw the emergence of Jim Crow laws. And you saw this last year in US history. Uh, you talked about Jim Crow laws. And those Jim Crow laws in the former Southern states, or the, the Southern states, formerly states of the Confederacy, they passed laws restricting the rights of African Americans. And suits were brought to try to challenge those restrictions. And the landmark decision from 1896 is Plessy versus Ferguson. So Plessy versus Ferguson involved Homer Plessy challenging the racially segregated rail cars of the state of Louisiana. And he challenged that, that he was, his rights were being restricted based on race and that he was being denied equal protection laws. Well, the court in 1896 interpreted the equal protection clause very narrowly and said that separate but equal meets the terms of the equal protection clause. It does, they said that the equal protection clause doesn't require integration, but rather it requires equality. So that became legal sanction for the Jim Crow segregation that emerged. Again, in US history last year, you learned about the concepts of de jure segregation, that is segregation by law, and de facto segregation, segregation by fact or circumstance. Now, I think it's important to note here that while we talk about de facto segregation being by fact or circumstance, that does not mean it was unintentional. It was not accidental, it was intentional. I was just trying to remember how I wrote it out on the piece of paper. So, um, and we can see that in that cities attempted to impose racial zoning, which the Supreme Court struck down around the time of the First World War in 1917. Uh, the use of restrictive covenants that lasted into the 1940s, post-World War II, where people could put restrictions on their land. You're probably more familiar growing up in the suburbs with, with restrictive covenants not based on race, but on things like what color you can paint your house or what type of uh, roofing material you can use on your house. And so you'll notice that in many of the newer subdivisions within the city, that the houses will all have certain uh, kind of earth tone, beige, tan, brown, uh, taupe colors, gray, but you don't see a lot of purples or blues. Um, and you don't see things like chain link fence in the front yard. Well, those are because the racial, not the racial, the restrictive covenants on the property restrict those things. Whereas in older parts of West Des Moines, where those restrictive covenants have expired because under Iowa law, they expire after a number of years, then you'll see more uh, adventurous colors on the houses. And then finally, redlining. Um, redlining was a practice of restricting uh, mortgage loans in certain neighborhoods, predominantly black and brown neighborhoods. And this, the legacy of redlining is that the most segregated cities in the United States today are not in the southern states, but rather they are in the north. They are cities like Chicago, Milwaukee, Detroit. And uh, so this was a very intentional thing. <clears throat> so to challenge this established system of Jim Crow segregation and denial of equality in violation of the 14th Amendment, uh, the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund uh, brought a series of lawsuits. They challenged separate but equal through these lawsuits. And I just picked out two, one because Brown versus Board is one of the 15 required cases of the AP curriculum. Um, 
But I put in Sweat versus Painter in 1950, not just because it's in your textbook, the Edwards textbook, um, but because I think it's an important precedent leading to Brown versus Board. So Sweat versus Painter involved the Texas law schools. You have the UT, University of Texas at Austin Law School, which is an elite top 25, consistently top 25 law school, one of the best law schools in the country. Um, but they did not allow black students to attend. Black students had to attend the uh, law school established in Houston for black students. It did not have equal resources. It did not have the equal number of professors, books in their library, et cetera. And all the quantifiable factors, they, it was not an equal law school. Well, in bringing the suit, Thurgood Marshall and the other attorneys at the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund recognized that even if Texas made those quantifiable factors the same, it would still be different. And that was a much easier argument to make to the court than the Brown versus Board case, because the court was made up of Harvard and Yale lawyers and Harvard and Yale graduates, law school graduates. And so the, um, when they made the argument, they could say to them, look, if you put the same number of books in a law school, we'll just say the University of Iowa Law School, as the Harvard Law Library has, and you hired the same number of professors, and you made all these quantifiable factors the same, there's still something special. There's still something qualitatively different about going to law school at Harvard. And that was an easy sell to the court because again, they were all Harvard grads and Yale grads and they, they knew there was something qualitatively different that you couldn't measure that equality just in the quantifiable factors. So Sweat versus Painter was also much less threatening to uh, segregationists and entrenched white supremacy because not many people go to law school. And by the time people go to law school, a lot of their racial perceptions and prejudices are well entrenched. So Sweat versus Painter was a much easier argument to the court and a much less threatening uh, challenge to white supremacy. But once they established the idea that qualitatively the experience could be different, then, when Brown versus Board of Education reached the court in 1954, again, a case you learn about in U.S. history, uh, the court was much more willing and ready to accept the argument and the quote there from the decision from Justice Warren's decision that separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. And so that this is a violation of the 14th Amendment's equal protection language, and they struck down the doctrine of separate but equal, at least in the educational context. So I'm going to stop there for today. Tomorrow we'll pick up and fill in some pieces. Tomorrow I'm hoping to do this via Zoom, and uh, so we'll see how that goes. I'll post the Zoom meeting number and the password in tomorrow's assignment. Thanks a lot, and good Good to be back.